Soaring Spirits of the Pacific Northwest, Ghost Loving Friends. This is Martina, and as always, I'm here with my co-host and friend, James. Hello. And we are so happy you are here. This week, in honor of our recent trip to Central Oregon, we are sharing the most haunted places in Bend that might just send a chill down your spine. So the first place on our list of haunted places in Bend is the Deschutes Historical Museum. Now, the Deschutes Historical Museum started off as the Reed School, and it's actually the school building that now houses the museum, but the school itself was built 100 years ago and named in honor of a retired local teacher and principal, Ruth Reed. Hmm. And it was open to teach 241 students ranging from the first grade to the eighth grade and was actually a pretty modern building for its time. Yeah. Had central heating, indoor plumbing, and even its own system of indoor hoses and, external, and an external fire escape in the event of fire. And if you go to the building today, you actually can, can see these... Um, faucets and things sticking out of the walls mm -hmm. so the people who ran the school wouldn't have to wait for someone potentially you know a little further away to come if there were ever a fire or whatever they could they could deal with it themselves and mm -hmm. so the school actually functioned mm -hmm. until 1979 when it became the Deschutes Historical Museum. Yep. The Reed School makes it into our list of hauntings today because of a really sad story that happened when the school was just being built. A man named, named George Brosterhouse, who's a local contractor along with his brother, was overseeing the building of the school and George was up on the roof one day working and yeah. actually fell off of it. Ooh. And that's why people believe that some of the, the occurrences that people have reported today are related to George. George. Yeah. That makes and, sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so there are a number of reasons why, people believe that the Deschutes Museum is haunted. Now, staff and visitors have reported seeing shadowy apparitions in period clothing, hearing footsteps and unexplained noises, and mm -hmm. witnessing the elevator operating on its own. And if you want even more specific examples of the kind of experiences people have had at the Deschutes Museum, museum manager Vanessa Ivey shared a few of them with the Broadside Online back in 2012. So we've got, you know, a history of stories going back 10, 12 years and even before that. But the first story that we wanted to share involves a museum guest. And according to the article, he was playing one of the pianos in the museum and turned to an employee who was sitting by him and asked who the man was sitting across from her. The employee was completely confused because she didn't see anybody wow. sitting by her. And in fact, she and the pianist were the only two people in the room that day. Hmm. And later on, when the gentleman was leaving the museum, he happened to look up at a wall and say, well, that's that man there in that picture. That's the guy that I saw. Wow. And as he said it, he was pointing to a photograph of a man named George Brosterhouse. Now, oh. another incident involves a guest who was conducting research in the library. And after searching all week and starting to get frustrated because they weren't finding what they were looking for, all of a sudden a book just sprang off the shelves and open the exact page with the information the researcher had been looking for. And yeah. so according to Ivy, this isn't really an uncommon occurrence. In fact, she told the broadside that George, uh -huh. right, this George Broster house from the piano, is not a bad ghost. He helps us find stuff. Research sometimes happens at the museum and it comes up that after research, researcher has exhausted all of the possibilities searching for a specific piece of information. An article will turn up out of the blue, some puzzle piece they were looking for just manages to appear. And this happens so often that they call these things a George moment. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, George is not all alone, though, in the building. In fact, mm. there are also reports of a second ghost roaming the halls, and people call her Margie. And she, huh. Margie's been described as a six or seven year old girl dressed in clothes from like maybe the 1910s, 1920s. And you might be wondering how they know her name is Margie. Well, a museum intern was there one night and made a late night recording that picked up a voice that kept repeating the name Margie. So they decided that that must be the name of the ghost. And as stories would have it, little Margie is a pretty mischievous little thing. <laughs> Sometimes she can be heard giggling or she likes to play with the water taps, according to stories, huh. and also enjoys flushing the ladies' restroom toilets. And we actually got to visit the museum when we were in Bend a couple weeks ago. And yep. for James, I believe you said this was your first time there, right? Right. Yep. Right. And for me, it was my second time. And I have to say that neither of those times were times when I had any kind of direct experience of anything paranormal at all. I don't know mm -hmm. if you felt like you saw anything or sensed anything, James? No, it was um, it was pretty quiet that way, you know, as far as that goes, you know, as far as feeling anything or anything like that. We did try to do some EVP work, but the museum has um, like televisions with interviews from, mm -hmm. you know, people from the the olden days, I'll call it or whatever going. So it was really hard to, you know, to tell what was going on or anything. Um, but they had some really neat exhibits. They had one with a bunch of medical, old medical equipment. And um, so that was kind of interesting to look at and, and see. And I had heard <clears throat> about George before, but I'd mm -hmm. never heard the Margie until you just brought it up. So that's really interesting. I didn't know there were two. Yeah. And most of the um, stories that that I found, too, when I was mm -hmm. researching were about George and Margie was just yeah. mentioned in one place. OK, so, yeah. But I thought yeah. that was an interesting addition, and it makes sense yeah. to me, right, with kids uh -huh. being uh -huh. around there, that, yep. that there could be a child spirit sure. in, the, in the building. But, you know, whether you experience any kind of paranormal occurrences or not, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. museum itself is just really interesting and gives a really yeah. nice snapshot of the little community of Bend. Mm -hmm. Um and its history. And if you want to see for yourself, if George is still keeping an eye on the place, you can visit the museum from 10 to 430, Tuesday through Saturday. And if you see him, be sure to give our best to Mr. Broster. <laughs> <laughs> did it, Did they know who George Broster was? Was he just a community person? He or? was a, he and his brother ran a contracting business. Oh, okay actually and he will come up a little later in our five oh, nice. top cool. spots very good very interesting yeah great little museum cute, yeah. cute little school <clears throat> so the number two uh place in bend is called the O'Kane building uh the O'Kane building was built in 1916 it's a very historic downtown building it has a reputation for unexplained phenomena particularly on the top floor so tenants of the building have reported kind of eerie occurrences like strange lights footsteps even disembodied voices and some unexplained smoke which would be very scary in an old building because of the old wiring and you know you kind of kind of freak you out a little bit so after hours employees um have also reported the voice of a woman calling orders uh when no one else is around and an apparition of an old man believed to be the original building owner, um, Hugh O'Kane, uh, has been seen in the building as well. Um, there's also a ghost said to haunt the basement, and even those passing the building at night have reported orbs or lights floating uh, in the upstairs windows. So if you want to check this out, um, we certainly don't blame you. It sounds like a really great building to go into we had so much to to do in ben we didn't get to this particular building um but the the 
building's eerie atmosphere and the tales of the unexplained occurrences um, <clears throat> kind of make it a must visit for those who have have time and are kind of seeking out a spooky experience in Ben. Um, you can book a spot uh, with the Ben Ghost Tours, um, who say our guests are always, you know, getting amazing photographic evidence of the paranormal um, from that particular building. So, um, and they are a local tour group there in Bend. Um, or you can just stop by, you know, have lunch or a drink. Uh, the building is still in use today, and it houses uh, several different types of businesses. Uh, it has offices also, including, you know, restaurants and shops. Um, and you can just explore it and uh, grab a beer at the Bend Brewing Company and ask the staff about the hauntings. I'm sure they'll have stories as well. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like an interesting spot to visit. Yeah. So, yeah, the architecture is really interesting too with the big, huge, like windows on the first. Yeah. In between the, yeah, we saw a lot floor. of really great architecture when yeah. we were wandering around Bend, which was really cool. Next on our list of haunted places in Bend is the Lara House Lodge. Now, Lara House Lodge was built for Arthur and Mabel Lara in 1910, and it's mm -hmm. A charming bed and breakfast today that's housed in a craftsman style home. And it's located in what today is called Ben's Drake Historic District. And while the house was built in 1919, the Laras actually only lived there until, I'm sorry, the house was built in 1910. The Laras okay. only lived there till 1919. After that, it was a number of different things including a girl's dorm, a depression era boarding house, and a house for families of army personnel stationed at Camp Pendleton, not Camp Pendleton, at Camp Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> Camp Pendleton would probably be a bit of a drive. And since 1983, the home has been a bed and breakfast that is rumored to have a spectral resident who likes to move objects around and whisper in the night. Guests have recounted tales of hearing voices when no one's there, of objects huh. moving on their own, and even sightings of a ghostly woman on the top floor. People have seen her outside through a window. And the thing that's so interesting about that is that the top floor is actually said to be empty. And uh -huh. because it's, yeah. And because it's a B and B, you can actually even stay overnight and fully immerse yourself in the potential for a paranormal encounter. And because the owners are around because they run the B and B, you uh -huh. have the opportunity to ask them about their experiences and some nice. of the experiences other guests have had as well. And do they know? Do they think they know who the haunter is? Is it Miss? Uh, is it Mabel, or they just don't really know? Um, I don't know. I didn't okay. see anything about who she was. Just okay. That. Yeah, I haven't either. I just thought maybe you saw something. People, no, no. Huh. Unfortunately, no. Just that people have okay. seen a woman who looks like she's not from today wandering. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff in Bend for, you know, being yeah. a relatively small town. It it's also an old town. I mean, old yeah. for the side of the country anyway, right? Yeah, everything yeah. relative here. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But Bend has a lot of history and a lot of haunted mm -hmm. history in particular, which is pretty cool for people like us who yeah. enjoy ghost stories. Yeah, it was originally it was an old um, mill town. There were two really large yeah. mills and you know that people had to die at the mills. It was very dangerous and still is to work at a lumber mill. And yeah, so that's probably a lot of it. Um, right. Yeah. There are certain types of jobs that tend to incur more casualties and yeah. lumber mills are definitely high yeah. on that list. And I would imagine yeah. back in the day, probably even higher. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Today. Yeah. There was no safety, no OSHA exactly. back in the 1900s. <laughs> Um, so our number four spot is called, was called the Platypus Pub. And it's really sad because this building isn't, isn't here anymore. The pub isn't there anymore. Um, and I think they tore it down like maybe the year before we came, the fall before we came, went up there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, they may have torn it down. <clears throat> so it used to be a Nazarene church and it was turned into a tavern located at 1203 Northeast 3rd Street. 
and it was said to have its own spectral presence in the basement uh, where the pub was located. So the upstairs wasn't the pub, it was actually down uh, in the uh, in the basement. Yeah. So some say it was a former owner, while other whispers um, of a cook um, who was kind of still lingering around. But both staff and patrons reported seeing shadow apparition and kind of just feeling this unseen presence. Um, there were stories of employees who were afraid to work alone, patrons who described part of the building as giving them this kind of, you know, eerie, ominous feeling, um, lights that would turn on by themselves, and then shadow apparitions that um, kind of whisked past people and people felt them, you know, going right past them. So some pretty interesting stuff when it was when it was there. So why are we telling you about this at the church? The house of pub was demolished. Oh, way back in 2018, way before we, we went up there. Um, because it begs the question of what happens to spirits when the building they haunt is torn down and, and gone. Um, do they disappear along with the structure? Do they remain as part of the land? Um, you can find out for yourself by visiting the Platypus Pub's former location on 3rd Street. Uh, it is now a retail center. Uh, including a possibly haunted Starbucks with a drive through uh, So grab a coffee and see what you sense. That's a great point, though. What what do you think happens? Yeah, you know, I, th I think it's probably situational. I mean, mm -hmm. if the person was actually tied to the building because they built the house or they lived there, right. then maybe there is no reason for, for that spirit to stay once it's gone. But I think something that yeah. we tend to forget sometimes too is that just because there's a house there now doesn't mean there wasn't a whole other history that happened before right everything exactly well everything everywhere here was once native american land and there's thousands of years of history of right. of people from those tribes living on the land so it's not always necessarily that it's this house or this coffee shop or this yeah. church yeah. in particular, you right. know, one of the, I want to hear what you think, but before, before I forget, one of the mm -hmm. really great examples I can think of is the Irma Tinker house in, in yeah. Oregon city, which actually sits in a place that it didn't originally sit. And before that, there was another house mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And before that, there was whatever history <laughs> occurred before, right. you know, European settlers came into or white settlers came into this area. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so even talking about that particular house, like what is the haunting there? Is it from the Ermitinger house, which mm -hmm. was moved from its original location? So something that came along with the house? Right. Is it something that remains there from the original building that stood in that place. Uh -huh. You know, I think there are a lot of layers yeah. that can be there. That's why I say I really think it's situational and depends on the spirit and the building and the history and all of that. Mm -hmm. But what do you think? Yeah, I, I I tend to agree with with what you're saying. I think um you know like you said there's a ton of you know thousands of years of Native American history in and around Oregon, all over the country, really. Um, yeah. Especially around, in and around Oregon and the and the coastal areas. <clears throat> and I think if something is on the land, attached to the to the land, and then something's built on it, you know, we don't know, and that's part of the reason we do this, we don't know what the spirit understands. Or, <clears throat> you know, do they even know there's a building there now? They they may mm -hmm. not, or they may. Right. right? And I may be upset about so it because you hear a lot of activity will pick up when people start to remodel. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Uh, people remodel, things start to happen. Um, if they are truly attached to just the building, again, if you tear that building down, do they know it's gone? Do they know, you know, where is, does, is it then their time to, you know, pass on or go over to the other side or whatever right mm -hmm. um, it's interesting and and yeah. nobody really knows <clears throat> well 
Right. I mean, that's the case with so much of this, right? We have our ideas about what we think it is, yeah. but yeah. do yeah. we really so, have 100% definitive proof always of what we're yeah. dealing with? No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There. Yeah, to, and sit down and have a full on conversation, with, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yep. It's interesting. Yeah. And there can be spirits of, spirits of place that are much older than any, you know, structures, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially the modern ones. So yeah. it's an interesting yeah. question. What happens when the building's gone? Yeah. And speaking of cool buildings, one of the places that we actually did get to visit, which mm -hmm. I think was um, for both of us among the favorite places we stopped, and not only for the ghosts, partly <laughs> just for the food, <laughs> yeah. Big time. Uh -huh. was the Café de Chutes. Mm -hmm which used mm -hmm. to be the Sparrow Bakery, which if you search on the internet, you can find lots of stories about the hauntings at the at the Sparrow Bakery. But anyway, mm -hmm. the building that houses the Cafe de Chutes was built in the 1920s, and it was actually the payroll office for the Bend Ironworks. Mm -hmm. And some believe that this now adorable cafe that has amazing croissants uh -huh. Haunted by the spirit of the ironworks office assayer. And there have been mm -hmm. reports of a shadowy apparition and an unseen presence. Uh, most of the reports that I read were pretty much sounding like it was a benevolent spirit. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But some, the reason why a lot of people believe it's the assayer is that mm -hmm. the building features, when you go up to the front, um, I wanted to say front desk, but that's not it. The counter. Counter. Uh -huh. <laughs> when you go up to the counter, directly behind it, there's a big vault, and you can see the door. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people believe that because that's where the payroll would be kept, mm -hmm. that he remains in the space protective of the vault. Right. And back when the building was the Sparrow Bakery, the people who worked there actually gave the, they nobody. I guess nobody knows his name, but they named mm -hmm. him Jackson and told stories about him, including his habit of sneaking bread, opening <laughs> and closing the doors, especially if the door to the vault had been left over. And that's why people think there's a connection between um, him and the Bend Ironworks payroll. Interesting. And Visitors, too, have reported strange occurrences. People have talked about objects moving on their own and unexplained lights flickering and those sorts of things when they shouldn't be. Now, when we were there, we did try to do a little bit of EVP work, but it was not <laughs> at all yeah. successful because it was just really loud with people coming and going. The espresso yeah. machines have kind of a whir of their own. The mm -hmm. staff there was very talkative and telling mm -hmm. a lot of personal <laughs> stories uh -huh. in between serving guests. Um, and so while we did enjoy the ambiance and what I maintain is the best croissant I've ever eaten, um, yeah. Yeah. we didn't get a lot of good recordings. There was just too much noise yeah. and activity sure. going yeah. on. But yeah. the cool thing is that you can go into the bakery and hang out and maybe even move further to the back of the building than we were, where it's maybe going to be a little quieter and see. Uh -huh. What do you sense? What do you pick up? And the other thing that's really cool is that the building that the cafe is in is really part of a little complex of buildings, which are now uh, kind of shops and artist mm -hmm. galleries and things like that. And so you can wander around those buildings as well. And we went into one that was a really beautiful little gift shop mm -hmm. and um, kind of artists artist shop there was some workspace yeah. kind of in the back and yeah. I think it was the owner we spoke to she seemed yeah. in charge of things and she shared a story of a spectral hand that's mm -hmm. been seen in one of the other businesses that's right next door to her yeah. building or not even yeah. building her room in the building it's kind of this uh, big long row building so it's yeah. a bunch of things together it's really just I think it was just the cafe that's in its own separate little smaller right. building. But 
at any rate, you can go and visit the shops, grab a pastry and, you know, see for yourself if yeah. any spectral activity makes itself yep. known. Yep. Yeah, it definitely was a cool place to go and just sit and yeah. have coffee. The really great coffee. The food was outstanding. It was really good. Oh my gosh. Um, I would be there all the time if I lived there. <laughs> no. That, um, yeah, we, we to go back and see that all the time. Yeah. We yeah. had well, we both had a um what was on it? It had like some kind of tomato jam and that just yeah. like made everything. It tasted so good. Yeah, with egg and, and bacon. Yeah. And then I also got a pistachio croissant that was just like, yeah, just like it could bring tears to your eyes. It was heavenly. <laughs> it <laughs> was so, really good. It was and really so good. flaky and perfectly baked. It's yeah. Yep. Yep. And I, I would think, be if I lived there. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And I think the owner of that other store said that part of the property used to be like the machine shop for the ironworks for the mill her part um, of the property yeah yeah, yeah that yeah, that big so. long building <clears throat> yeah and again probably very dangerous work you know so people could have very well been killed in that building or you know mm -hmm. something but definitely a really cool yeah. place to go and check out so uh mcminniman's francis school <laughs> um is our number six and that is located in the downtown Bend area, right in the heart of downtown, which when we both saw it, we were like, well, that's an odd place for a school. But you have to remember there wasn't anything around there when it was first built, as you can see in the picture, just kind of a neighborhood. The It was a, it was a Catholic schoolhouse, and it's been turned into a hotel and pub. Um, and if you're not from the Pacific Northwest, don't know um, about McMinimans, um, they buy historic buildings basically old historic buildings and turn them into pubs and hotels they buy really big schools and some of yeah. them are really tiny little places and just have like a pub restaurant but it's really cool because they do um preserve the history yeah the they still have a lot of buildings in this part of yeah. the country yeah pretty neat um anyways so the pub there is said to have several ghostly residents including a former nun um, who still roams the halls in the spirit of a boy who drowned in the pool. Um, so it built in 1936, the Catholic school was in operation until 2000. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. um, it was later purchased by McMinimans, like I said, and converted into an entertainment complex and hotel. Uh, the Northwest chain describes as a, um, is complete with classrooms turned hotel rooms. And I put in a, example picture up there that that you know originally would have been a would have been a class uh, classroom mm -hmm. um so it has a theater a private meeting and event space they have live music and a soaking pool um that beckons you know day traveler shoppers hikers skiers um, and just all kinds of outdoor adventurers um the uh, haunting phenomena uh, have been reported throughout the entire complex including apparitions, disembodied voices, objects moving, lights turning on and off, uh, menacing presence has been felt there, and, and even a lot more stuff. Um, according to an employee, an elevator located where the nunnery um, used to sit, um, it, it kind of you know breaks down almost every month. Lights go on and off by themselves. Uh, the heating units will um, sporadically stop working, Guests have reported hearing children running and laughing upstairs, even though the hotel is only a one-story building, but it has a, probably an attic space up there. Um, and one couple staying at the hotel even described a truly creepy experience, uh, like so many of us do, um, as they got ready for bed. Uh, one of them placed their cell phone on the bedside table, and the next morning they wake, woke up to find a photo on it of them asleep in the bed and that's when i leave um, <laughs> me too yeah i i can take a lot but i don't know that'd be kind of creepy i um, know like after i read that i was kind of feeling good about <laughs> where we we actually else. did try uh -huh. to get reservations there yeah yeah but now i i do want to go there next time yeah um so if you piqued your interest uh next time you're in bend why not 
visit the hotel. You can sip on a craft beer while soaking in the historic atmosphere and listening for ghostly footsteps. Um, then you can hang out in the bar for a bit and see if the bartenders will share some of their spooky tales. And I did look at images um, online of the pool. It's very pretty. It's a soaking pool now. It's mm -hmm. really beautiful. They've done a lot of with it. But I didn't. I hadn't heard of the boy who drowned um, in the pool. So no, that's very. So last on our tour of Haunted Bend is the Pilot Butte Cemetery. And just before I go on, we know that there are more haunted locations in Bend, but because we didn't want this to go on for hours, we just kind of included some of our favorites. Maybe we'll yeah. come back and do another episode sometime yeah. with different locations or, or, or experiences we've had when we visit again. But yeah. just know that we are aware that there are more than seven. <laughs> But Pilot Butte Cemetery is one of the places that we visited when we were there recently. And mm -hmm. I have to say, it was just beautiful. We were there right after a snowstorm, and it was so peaceful and serene and just gorgeous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the cemetery, which is a historic cemetery with graves dating back to the 1800s. And in fact, it's not really one cemetery. It's made up of two cemeteries, Pilot Butte Cemetery and Greenwood Cemetery, cemetery that just sort of converged as they mm -hmm. grew. And kind of like our lone first cemetery here in Portland, it's a popular spot for locals to go for walks, bring their dogs along, and mm -hmm. it's also a favorite for ghost hunters. I have reported seeing strange lights in the cemetery after dark. Mm -hmm. People have heard disembodied voices and reported feeling a cold, eerie presence. Although I have to say it just felt kind of serene and peaceful. Yeah. yeah. Were there. there wasn't really yeah. anything eerie about mm -hmm. it. But I also mm -hmm. don't really get creeped out by cemeteries because my yeah. personal belief is that for the most part, the um, people who the bodies that inhabit them are really just bodies and that the soul moves on. And in most right. cases, there are no actual people left in the cemetery anyway. But right. that is right. just a bit of my personal opinion that you may or may not agree <laughs> with. Um, <laughs> but there have been reports by some who say they've seen this kind of huge, dark apparition wearing a cape and mm. that they believe him to be the Grim Reaper. Though, like I said, I don't know. Yeah. I'm also a little confused about the idea of why would the Grim Reaper be hanging out in a cemetery? Yeah. Right. It involves people who are transitioning from living to dead. So it kind of seems uh -huh. like maybe the cemetery wouldn't be where he hangs out. But yeah. you know, yeah. Reaper, the heart wants what it wants. So yeah. if you're hanging out in the cemetery after hours, you do you. We're not mm -hmm. going to judge. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. But the cemetery actually has a few notable notable residents, including our friend George Broster House from the Deschutes Historical Museum. He's okay. buried there. There's also a man whose name is Lynn Doyle Cooper, who uh -huh. was suspected or who is one of the men suspected of having been D.B. Cooper, the uh -huh. hijacker who disappeared. Uh -huh. And... The reason why he's on that list is, I think it was a niece of his, apparently heard her uncle and some other relative talking. Yes. And it sounded like, from their conversation, like Lynn may have actually been D.B. Cooper. Yep. Uh, even though I don't think there's ever really been any conclusive evidence, but still pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, another sad story of a young woman who came to a really horrible end is Susan Wickersham, who was abducted and murdered in the 1970s. And oh. that is a case that's actually still open because her killer never was found. And it's a pretty big cemetery. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you do a little research or go wandering around, you can find a lot of Ben's historic citizens buried there. But those three cool. kind of stood out as interesting ones, especially George Broster House, just because uh -huh. 
we started with him and the yeah. sad story of him falling off the roof of the Reed School. And so it just uh -huh. felt sort of right to circle back yep. and end with him yeah. too. And yep. you know, we were there during the day and it was snowy and mm -hmm. So it was a little too light out for us to see any glowing orbs, but yeah, it would yeah. have been beautiful in the snow with the moon and everything, um, yep. just because of the way the light reflects off of it. But you can visit and take your own moonlit stroll through the historic <laughs> graveyard there in Bend, where the dearly departed are said to linger, if you dare. Yeah. Yeah. And like others, yeah. maybe they'll even capture some evidence of their presence in a photograph or hear a voice or one of yeah. the many things we didn't hear. But again, mm -hmm. cemeteries are just one of those places that are yeah. filled with stories and fascinating just for that. Yep. And really, honestly, if it hadn't been quite as cold and snowy, we might have stayed a little longer and done a little right. Investigating, so I think yeah. that's definitely a place that we'd like to go back to, maybe in this yeah. summer. Yeah, there was a good two to three feet of snow on the ground, and, yeah. and it, so it wasn't really kind of walking around in their weather and not tripping over things. Um, yeah. the, one of the other things when you talked about the DB Cooper person, I I yeah. didn't realize who that was. But I actually just watched a documentary on D.B. Cooper. That's a really big thing in the North Pacific Northwest, if you're yeah, not familiar yeah. with it. Um, I remember that niece now in that documentary talking. Oh, she, this Lynn Doyle was actually um, pretty high on the FBI's suspect list for, for a oh, while wow. from that. Cool. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I all my knowledge of the whole DB Cooper story is really pretty top level. So uh -huh. that's really interesting uh -huh. to know and yeah, really interesting to dig a little further into yeah. that. Well, since it's so local. Yeah, yeah. But definitely a cool place. Definitely a neat place. Yeah. So and Bend is pretty anyway. I mean summer, it spring, is. winter. It, it's really a pretty Such place. A nice to city and the yeah. just the area around it is really cool too. High desert, such a different landscape from what we yeah. have here yeah. in Western Oregon. Um, yep. That yep. it's a really fun place to visit, kind of no matter what time of year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great place. Yeah. Definitely want to go so, back. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, as always, everybody, thank you for joining us um, for this episode. Thank you for all your support. Um, we've grown so quickly since yeah. just November. Um, so we really, really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, a little bit about what's coming up. So March 15th, we're going to do an episode of the Salem Pioneer Cemetery. That's supposed to be a place, um, a really good place to catch EVPs. So we will um, be investigating that. Uh, March 23rd and 24th, we're going to actually be at the big uh, Oregon Ghost Conference. I want to say that's the biggest um, Paracon kind of conference in the in the Pacific Northwest. So um, that'll be our second year going to that. So that'll be really interesting. <laughs> and that's because there are like two of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah. And then really gonna... cool event we went last year. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. They have all kinds of stuff. I mean, and I think, you know, this year is going to be really huge. I think they actually like had to put vendors on a waiting list because they ran out of space. Yeah, and it's supposed to be bigger this yeah. year even than it was last year. And even with that extra space, yeah. they ran out. And they've got yeah. some yeah. really cool classes that you can mm -hmm. sign up for and yep. some really fun looking events too where they're doing investigations that you can, for a small fee, go join mm -hmm. them on. And so you've got kind of an experienced paranormal yeah. investigator showing you the ropes and and taking you yep. to some of the haunted spaces around yeah. seaside which sounds like it'll yeah. be really fun yeah i think it'll be a great conference it was great the first year we went and now it's even even bigger yeah. so yeah and then on uh, march 29th they're just going to kind of do a review um, of the conference and kind of what we learned and kind of share our experience so that yeah. should be really fun um, anything else, Martina? I always feel like I left something out or forgot something or. No, just, you know, as, as 
James said, thank you, everybody who's mm -hmm. been listening and subscribing and supporting us. Yep. We really, really appreciate it. And we appreciate your questions and your interaction and just yep. everything you do to help us grow. And yep. we love hearing from you. So don't ever be shy to reach yep. out and be sure to yep. follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and mm -hmm. YouTube. <laughs> and to follow the actual podcast on Spotify or wherever yep. you listen to your favorite podcasts. And yep. I think that is everything. I think that's it. We're just everywhere. So we always look forward to to seeing everybody and hearing from everybody. And we will check back within, uh, with you again on March 15th when we do our uh, Salem Pioneer Cemetery episode. Yeah. We'll talk to you then. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great well, evening here. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Bye.